Well, uh, welcome. So we've got about 45 minutes, and I was just saying that I am super excited about this presentation because um, this is described in, in the list as a, a kind of coffee parlor conversation, interactive discussion on uh, the word why. And the reason I'm excited is that when I was a kid, uh, two words were banned in our house for about three months. And if you, um, I'm just going to get my notes. I definitely have my notes here. Uh, I was looking for notes on you. Yeah, you, no, 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 that you can, you can put a nice picture of a sunset or, or whatever you want. Put the, the logo up. Um, when I was a kid, two words were banned. And, and you can ask me later over uh, whiskey or wine what the other one was. But one of the words was the word why. When I was a kid, um, the word why was, was banned because I wouldn't stop asking it. And it got to the point where uh, my mother and her partner at the time were so sick of me asking why that they just said, OK, we need a break. And so from now on, do not use that word in the house. You can use it with your friends, but not in the house. So I went through a period of three months not being allowed to ask why. And it became a central theme in my life. I began to be. Fascinated. Welcome, welcome, welcome. As long as everyone has coffee, this is a coffee session. Welcome. <laughs> Come and sit down. Uh, I became, thank you, welcome. Uh, I became fascinated by the word why. In fact, what happened is I became fascinated by what it means to be a human being. Just let these uh, people find a seat. Come to the front. You can hear the jokes better. <laughs> if you've seen any of my other sessions, it's the same jokes, so don't worry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's why I never like sitting in the front row. Okay. Handstand. Handstand. Okay. Well, I'll do the. I tell you what. So my party trick is a fingertip handstand. And if you, if you remind me tonight at the Evo Madness event, I will, I will do a fingertip handstand. Oh. I, will, I, will, I will do it. I can, yeah, I'll do the fingertip handstand. So. <laughs> You're being recorded, yeah. so we can. Yeah, I, no, I'll do it. I was going to say, I can do, I can do the fingertip one-handed press-ups, but it's no good for the people at the back. So. Um, when I was a kid, I remember being about three years old, and I remember looking. We had this spinning top. And I remember looking at the spinning top and trying to make it go as fast as I could make it go. It made a sort of a whistling, wooing kind of noise. And I remember thinking, oh, OK, that's what that does. And, and then I started thinking, I wonder why it does that. Why actually would it do that? What's it for? And I, and I thought, well. I suppose it's entertaining. I was a bit bored quite quickly. But I can see why people would think that it was a good thing. And then some light bulb moment happened in my head. And I thought, the reason it does that is that somebody designed it that way. I didn't have the word design. I was three. But I had in my mind that somebody chose to make it that way. And that was the reason why it worked that way. This sounds kind of dumb as I say it now. but. What I'm describing is causality. At three years old, I realized that it wasn't that way, where you press the thing at the top and it spins around and it makes a woo sound. It wasn't that way because of some intrinsic property to nature, or the four laws of thermodynamics, or some divine transcendent being deciding that it should be that way. It was that way because people decided to make it that way. And they decided to make it that way. Welcome, come in, the seats at the front. <laughs> It's the best seats in the house. Uh, people decided to make it that way because in their opinion, in their opinion, that was a good idea. And at three years old, I thought, I need a new toy. I'm done. But then I kind of became obsessed with this question. Much later, years later, I realized that people's opinions are not emergent properties of nature, that people's opinions don't just occur 
as an uncaused cause. Anyone studied free will and causality and uh, rational philosophy, everything has a cause. And the only thing, according to rational philosophy, that can be a causeless cause or a prime mover, the only thing that can do that is a transcendent being that lies outside of space-time, and that's God. The problem is, as soon as you define it, then you need a bigger universe and a bigger universe, and I'm definitely not going to get into the theocratic argument. But this means that we live in a mechanistic universe. And so actually, interestingly now, if you look at the judicial system, where we're finding that people have key markers in their genes that indicate a predisposition towards certain types of crime, some criminals have successfully argued that their punishment should be ameliorated. They should get a reduced sentence because they have a genetic predisposition to criminality. And they won that argument. And so we have this distinction between culpability and responsibility. And so uh, to go back, these are all of my notes for this presentation. And I'm, I always joke that I mix them up with the shopping list, must buy mushrooms and, um, and get new more bread. But this is, is my notes. I have a very small number of things that I want to talk about a lot. Uh, for everyone who came late, uh, I am a futurist because I have a British accent or the remnants of one. Uh, people in America think I know what I'm talking about. I do not, just so we're clear. There's no uh, legal basis for my recommendations. I can't remember the disclaimer that... I should put on the back. I should have a thing on my back that says no responsibility will be taken. So I want this session to be kind of in two, I want there to be two flavors merged into this session. One is I'm going to express some ideas about what the word why means. And I want to talk about how we justify what we intend to do, how we rationalize what we have done and ultimately how we make all decisions. And I'm going to argue, and I'm the one with the microphone, so it's gonna be super difficult for you to, <laughs> to, to argue with me. Um, I'm going to argue that if I jump from A to Z or Z, since we're in, when in Rome, from A to, by the way, I record a lot of tutorials and they force me at the end to record a little audio patch of me saying Z, 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 because I do all video editing, hey there, uh, <laughs> video editing and uh, post-production techniques, and they have to audio patch my recording. So instead of saying control Z, it says control Z. I think it's shameful, it's just embarrassing. <laughs> um, but to jump from A to Z, I believe, there's a couple of seats, go ahead, I believe I believe that every single decision you have ever made and every decision you will make between now and the day you die, which is that and taxes is pretty much all we're sure of, every single decision is either motivated by love or fear. And I'm going to argue that case today. You can disagree with me later at the Evo Madness event. And I finish doing handstands, and I understand there will be wine. So, <laughs> <laughs> helps, helps. Apparently, the UN have 10,000 bottles of wine or more, 30,000 bottles of wine in their cellar to help with negotiations. <laughs> so, what do we mean when we say the word why? What we're, what we're doing is we're either making an excuse or we're offering an explanation. Can anyone tell me the difference between those two words? What is the difference between an excuse and an explanation? Go ahead. The excuse is to avoid consequence or responsibility, and the explanation uh -huh. is to understand it. Okay. Did, did anyone, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll summarize. How about you? Whether or not you agree with it. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, why they, that's awesome. That's why they say history is written by the victors, right? <laughs> So you get, you know, in, in British history, we have a lot of people that had a God-given right to win. What they mean is they had a bigger sword than the people that they stabbed. And we were joking last night that Britain can sometimes be quite stabby. I don't think that's a word that you use here. We don't have guns, we have knives. So uh, I would argue pretty much what you said. I would argue that the difference between an excuse and an explanation is as follows. 
An explanation is intended to elucidate. It's intended to increase understanding and empower the person that you're communicating with. As my uh, advanced driving instructor once told me, indication is no indication. But you should use the indicators in your vehicle whenever you believe there is a person who might benefit from knowing your intentions. So, you know, uh, <laughs> I remember when I was 12, my, my mother had a, a partner who, um, he had what I now understand with my adult lens, had uh, what, what they call anger management issues. And he would get very angry about things very suddenly. And I didn't realize as a kid it was because of things that had happened to him a long time ago. It had nothing to do with what was happening now. And I remember being quite fascinated as he absolutely lost his temper, absolutely lost his mind. That's the politest language I can use. Because my brother and I had eaten all the cookies. And I remember sort of phasing out whatever he was saying. It was just very shouty. And I remember thinking, I'm 12. It is my prerogative to eat all the cookies. It's definitely. Yep, definitely OK for me as a 12-year-old to eat all the cookies. And I don't know what you're upset about. And he was shaking the tin upside down to illustrate that there were no more cookies in the tin. And I was watching the crumbs fall on the ground. And I was thinking, to, I was silently, I'm British, we silently judge. I was silently judging him, <laughs> thinking, <laughs> thinking, oh, I know what you're doing now. Any minute now, you're going to storm out of the house angry. And who's going to sweep up all the cookies on the kitchen floor? Muggins. I'm going to have to clean up the cookies crumbs that you dropped on the floor because you're too upset to clean up your mess. And by the way, I'm 12. I'm allowed to eat the cookies. So <laughs> had he stopped to ask me why I ate all the cookies, my answer would have been, because I'm 12, next question. <laughs> and that would have been a valid explanation. An excuse is intended to ameliorate punishment. An excuse is intended to, you know you're guilty, you're culpable, you did something wrong, and now you want to be punished less. Oh, I couldn't help it. I, I pulled out into the traffic and hit your car because the sun was in my eyes. It wasn't my fault. Actually, you're not supposed to pull out into traffic when you're dazzled by the sun and cannot see. So you're actually still in the wrong. You definitely should not have pulled out into traffic. But now, you know, OK, we'll make mistakes. All right, then. Three is in prison instead of five, or whatever the decision is. So actually, if you think about whether or not you ought, and you know there's this distinction between must, could, should, might, ought, whether you ought to seek to give an excuse or give an explanation, ultimately comes down to why you did what you did. Now, I would argue, we don't have time for it today. See, at, at film school, they said, if you point when they take a picture, it makes you look important. So, <laughs> you shouldn't point. Oh, no, you need to. Oh, that's right. Yeah, so you shouldn't elbow or whatever. So <laughs> I would argue that since every single, I would argue that thinking is a form of action. Unfortunately for our conscious minds, it turns out that we don't make decisions consciously at all. That's not how thinking works. Your non-conscious mind, all the evidence suggests that your non-conscious mind thinks through all the facts, looks at all the information, makes a decision, and then a moment later, your conscious mind has the delusional experience of making the decision. It's actually a memory that's experienced first person. And unfortunately, it seems to be a kind of Victorian era. Um, who's this calling me? It's a Victorian era leftover that we believe that the self is the conscious mind. And I want to speak briefly today about what personification is and what selfhood is. We'll get to that in a minute. This is hardcore philosophy today, which is why I hope you brought your cup of coffee. I'm in the wrong time zone. In the UK right now, it's not too late at 9 o'clock. So, You experience something, and having experienced it, you make a decision about it. And having made a decision, you take action on the basis of that decision. Every single part of that occurs non-consciously and precognitively. 
and then a moment later your conscious mind has the experience of deciding to do that stuff. So let's just put consciousness aside for a minute. It's a really interesting topic. It's not what we're really talking about today. What we're talking about today is the actual decision-making process for your mind. Here's a great example. You're sitting in a meeting. You haven't said anything for a while, and your boss nudges you and says, say something. There's a friend of mine, he's a business analyst, he had this experience. He's just minding his own business, attending the meeting, and his boss says, you should say something. And he was saying, I, I have nothing to say. I'm like, why would I say something? He said, well, it'll, it'll, you know, people will notice you. It's a good thing for people to notice you in the company. So my friend's sitting there doodling, and he's thinking, well, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll say something. So he says, yeah, that's a great idea. That's good. That idea is really good. And then everyone looks at him like, thanks, thanks, uh, you know, but so what? And so it seemed that his decision to speak and to act was misplaced, because it was. Not because the action was wrong, but because the cause for the action was wrong. And when you feel the need to make an excuse, I would argue, most of the time, it's because your causes were wrong. Somebody in a, I studied martial arts for years. Anyone studied a martial art? Yeah? So when you first start, uh, you learn how to punch. It's the best thing ever. Turns out most people don't know how to punch. And now you want to punch everything. And then you realize that getting punched hurts. And then you discover that punching other people kind of hurts more in a weird sort of way because you feel really bad about it. If you actually really succeed in hurting someone, you immediately feel like, I'm sorry, are you OK? And so anybody that you meet who says they do a martial art, and they're really friendly, and they just want to drink tea with you, never fight them, because they're really good at fighting. Like, they're the super martial artists. So when you learn to fight, and you, you realize that, that causing harm harms you, then you seek to avoid conflict, not because you're weak and vulnerable, but precisely because you're not weak, because you're strong. You seek to ameliorate the suffering of others. You seek to support and serve and be a strength for others. And if that is your motivation, and someone says, why did you say that thing? Why did you do that thing? Why did you act in that way? You will not make an excuse. You will give an explanation. You don't have to give an explanation. You can just say, I have my reasons. But actually, perhaps the most helpful thing is to empower, inform, educate the person you're speaking to in such a way that they understand you. And in understanding you, they are able to work better with you and be happier themselves. Question. But don't they have to be ready to hear that? It's none of your business. It was a great question. Don't they have to be ready to hear your explanation? No. But communication is about being understood. It's not self-expression. That's poetry. You can just write, write poetry in a book and pay people to read it, because it's difficult to get people who really want to read poetry these days. But provided you seek to be understood in the way that you express yourself. And by the way, here's a hot tip. If you want people to understand you, uh, people listen the way they speak. So if you listen well to the, the, the lexicon, the language, the structure of the sentences, the frame of reference, the context for the people that you're communicating with, and you give your understanding shrouded in that context, they will understand you more clearly. Whether they agree with you or not, which I think is where you're headed, is a different thing. They don't have to so agree with you. They may not even want to hear your right? Then, well, and, and that's where I would say it's none of your business. The opinions other people have of you is none of your business. It's hard to reconcile to that. But, but my point is that if somebody asks your question, why did you do that, and your motivation was to the best of your knowledge, and we'll get into the sense of self and our self-image and how we perceive our value system in a minute, but if your motivation was benign, you will never seek to give an excuse. You just won't feel moved to. You might feel indignation, and that's just pride. That's you feeling that you were not respected enough. And it's a fundamental human need. We're social primates. We need to feel respected. And if respect is not demonstrated, 
actually, that's a really big deal. You know, uh, I, I don't know if everyone in the room will have experienced racism in one form or another, or ageism, or sexism, or homophobia, or whatever the ism is. But you can demonstrate an ism with just a sneer and the turn of phrase. You don't have to say words that are, I need a, what, what word would you say, ismist? You know, it doesn't matter what it is. You know, you, we've all experienced it in one way or another to a greater or lesser extent. And being respected is critical. But again, if your intentions were good and positive, you will not offer an excuse. But if you know you're guilty, not, not what you did, you, know, you never know if you did the right thing, but if you know that your intentions were not good, there's a beautiful video of a politician, I think it was at the UN, they had really nice pens on the, on the table, and someone caught this politician putting the pen in their pocket and stealing it from, I think it was the UN. They stole this pen from the desk at the UN. And it went all over the internet. Because <laughs> everyone's thinking, come on, dude, you can buy a pen, right? But in any other situation, it wouldn't have mattered. But in a position of such high regard, a position of such status, you should not allow yourself, probably should, I'm not saying ought, you perhaps should not steal the pens. And what he did in that moment was demonstrate that his intentions, his motivations, were selfish in a role that should be selfless. So is everyone cool with that distinction about an explanation and an excuse? So I would put it to you. Yeah, question. I'm still struggling a little with that because yeah. you know what I respond. Yeah, good. Okay. I'm, I'm going to be 45 in three weeks, so I'm with you. But why, why does it not work? I guess the part of my understanding is why the because I'm 12 is, is not an excuse. Oh. Because that seems like a big part of what you're always Okay, to thank you. Th thank you for highlighting that. Okay, that's a good point. Okay. So, all right. So, when you're 12, actually, that was just being funny. Me eating all the cookies because I'm 12 is no excuse. But the fact that my frontal lobes hadn't fully developed and therefore the concept of consequence is biologically denied to me <laughs> at 12 is <laughs> a pretty solid argument. You sound like you're making an excuse. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but it's an explanation. <laughs> So here's a great example. Uh, one second. When you're two years old, um, people, I don't have any kids, so I'm definitely, you read the warning, right? No, no uh, accountability for what I'm telling you. Two-year-olds have no concept of uh, boundary transgressions. They really don't. But they're still at the stage where they're learning patterns. So they have this thing where they throw things on the floor. And it's a very common thing that two-year-olds, 18 months to like uh, 24 months, you know, 30 months, uh, you have very young children, toddlers, they start throwing things on the floor. And the parent goes and they pick it up, and they put it down. And they'll do that 15 or 20 times. And it gets to the point where the parent is convinced that they're boundary testing. And they realize, oh, I, wait, I, I have to set a boundary. Because, because if I don't set a boundary, then it creates an imbalance in our relationship, and I have to be an authority for my kid. And so I'm going I'm to set this boundary, I'm going to tell off the child. And I'm saying, no, and I'm going to take the thing and I'm going to put it over here. You don't get to play with that thing anymore because you keep throwing it on the floor. The kid was really just learning a pattern. I throw this thing on the floor, and this shape, this sort of big shape thing, I feel very strongly about, but I had no idea what it really is, comes and gets the thing and puts it back. And then I drop it on the floor again, and then it comes over. And it, but it takes different amounts of time, and it makes different noises. And I <laughs> kind of work that out. And then... You know, I'm, I'm sensing this thing is not happy, but I, you know, let's try that again. And just put it on the floor. So what's happening is that the two-year-old doesn't have the concept of a boundary transgression or of a power play, but appears to. And so while it's, it's critical, we were talking about this uh, before we started, it's critical for you to know yourself. And the only way to know yourself is without judgment. If you, and by that I don't mean discernment, if you have value opinions about yourself. You know, I, I travel a lot and I, and I want to go to the gym and don't 
because I'm traveling. And then when you're traveling, it's always a big event, so which means you go to a fancy restaurant, and it's all cream and butter and salt. And then I look in the mirror and I think, oh, goodness. And then and I feel badly because I've chosen to not go to the gym and work out and eat salad. And then I remember, oh, yeah, I'm human. <laughs> and I'm tired and I'm jet lagged. And that's OK. And it's, it's important to acknowledge what is real. And the only way for you to perceive what is real is to remove the blinkers and the filters and the, the, the lenses of judgment. Having an opinion about what is real is the next step. The first step is to know what is real. That's why in ancient Greece it said over the temple door, know thyself. Above all, know thyself. You cannot know yourself. You cannot know your situation. And you cannot know the people you are with if you see them through the filter of judgment. Look at isms. We were touching on you know, racism and ageism. What a waste of energy to meet somebody and prejudge them because of the amount of melanin in their skin or you know, they have an accent that you don't recognize. So you put all this energy into presuming to know what they're thinking. Such a waste of energy. And so if you can begin with absolute lucidity, unfettered by your prior opinions and judgment, just what is it? Now you can have an opinion about it. And this is truest when it comes to your awareness of yourself. Uh, there was an organization that tested out how to help people stop smoking. It turns out that most of the ways that people use to stop smoking, which is an array, you know, if you are a smoker or you have been a smoker, there is no denying that going out for a cigarette is awesome. And we all pretend it's not. We all say, ah, you know, it makes you smell and you die. And so who wants to do that? But the fact is you get a little hit, kicks off the adrenaline, the adrenal glands in your body, your brain sharpens up, your eyes focus, you feel alive and in the moment for a moment, and you smell and you die. I mean, all that's true. <laughs> but <laughs> all of that is true. But this organization found that most of the systems that people use to help people quit smoking were actually uh, creating attachments to smoking. They were making smoking the centerpiece of their identity. Who are you? I am a person who is trying to quit smoking. And if what you perceive yourself as is someone trying to do something, then trying to do it is exactly what you get. If you perceive yourself as someone who is doing something or has done something, you get that. You make decisions and judgments precognitive based on that, cognitively based on that outcome. So this organization said, what would happen if we used mindfulness? This is an old concept that's got a new name. And what we'll say is you can smoke as many cigarettes as you like, whenever you want, at any time. There's no limit on the number of cigarettes that you can smoke. And the participants in the study were saying, this is awesome. Not sure how that's going to help me quit smoking, but I'm with you so far. And they said, but you have to really smoke the cigarettes. And that means that little ritual you have for the way that you light the cigarette, the way you open the packet, take the cigarette out, put the packet down, hold it up to your face, the way you hold the lighter, the way you share cigarettes with other people, every second you must really experience it. And when you inhale the smoke, and you get that little acrid smell up your nose, and really smell that. And when you inhale it, really feel the smoke coming into your body, and feel the biochemical reactions that are going, and the molecules exchanging in your lungs. Feel that happening. And when you exhale, feel the smoke coming out of your mouth. Really experience the cigarette. When you put it out, how it sounds, the smell that comes from it, what you the experience of looking for a place to throw the cigarette butt. 90% of the people in the study completely quit smoking. Because smoking cigarettes is disgusting. <laughs> and the only way most people can smoke is by teaching themselves to not notice how disgusting it is. Because it's addictive, and like anything that's addictive, the brain will seek to find a way. So. 
personal change, changing your environment, boundary transgressions, when people are pushing you in ways that are unacceptable to you, if you don't redress the boundary, you just agreed to a new boundary. You just did. And you can, you can redress that boundary on its own without adding to it this prejudgment that they're intentionally trying to kill you. That was the, you know, there was a, a joke, uh, a girlfriend years ago who was convinced that this lady at work hated her and I used to say, how has she tried to kill you today? There's got to be a way that she's, she's really trying to do you in. And we would joke about that. And it got to the point in the end where my, my partner, she, uh, she left the company. She couldn't stand it anymore. And she gave in her notice. And the person in the office most upset that she was leaving was the woman that she was convinced hated her and was trying to make her life a misery. She just hadn't understood what was going on. So my overarching argument is, yeah. You can't say, because I'm 12. And at 12, you can't say, because my frontal lobes haven't developed and the concept of consequence isn't part of my realm. But there is a reality that is the lives of 12-year-old children. And if you understand it, that understanding allows you to make, as a second stage, a proper assessment, which again is not the same as judgment. There's an amazing book, um, Nonviolent Communication. Has anyone heard of the system of nonviolent communication? Boom. There's usually three books I recommend. One's that. The other one is Illusions by Richard Bach. And the other one is Crucial Confrontations. Those three books have really changed my life. The system of nonviolent communication argues that any time you define the person that you're communicating with in any way, you will annoy them. That's what the author calls violence. So how do you avoid it? You just don't tell people what they are. You tell them what you are. You tell them about your experience and how you feel about your experience. And do not tell them why they did anything or what they are. It's surprisingly difficult. The first three chapters of the book tell you what the thing is. And you think, ah, I definitely don't do that. And the rest of the book tells you that you do do it. And you realize, oh, yeah, I really I do do that. So the reason that this session is about coffee, is a why. I mentioned earlier that the word why was banned in our house when I was a kid. I would argue that if you ask why enough, uh, why, you know, for example, why, why am I giving a session on what why means today? <coughs> well, because the word, that word's really important to me. Well, why is that word important to you? Well, it was part of my inquisitive thing when I was a kid that I wanted to understand how things worked. Why is it important to you to understand how things work? Well, because that allows you to have control and you know what's going on in your world. Why is it important to you to have control? You go, why, why, why enough? You eventually arrive at, because I feel it. Most parents teach toddlers using emotional reward and punishment. They give or withhold love in order to guide their child towards behaviors that are acceptable to them as adults or to what they perceive as acceptable to society. An old psychologist friend of mine used to say, most of our problems, if not all of our problems, are based on what other people think of us or what we, more particularly, what we think other people think of us. Our perception of the opinions of others is at the root of our problems and our successes. And isn't that a shame? In Zen philosophy, they would argue, you know, the, in Buddhism, there's this argument that if you have attachments to things, it leads to suffering. And uh, I always would always say the Buddha had no attachments to you having attachments. You know, go ahead. It's just that, it, you know, because you care about a thing, then the stakes are higher and you, you might suffer as a consequence. But we care about things. And in caring about them, we come to form an identity which I'll get to again in a minute. But ultimately, it comes down to because you feel it. Now, when I was a kid, I did not grow up with my father. My parents separated when I was about six months old. I didn't know because for the first couple of years of my life, he would come over after work, have dinner with us, put my brother and I to bed, and then go home. And I thought the reason I never saw him in the morning was he'd already gone to work. And it was only much later I discovered he lived in another house and nobody thought to mention when I was old enough to understand that my parents had separated. 
And so I just couldn't understand why my dad lived in another house. No one, no one told me. Why would they? And it was years later. So as I got older, we would visit, you know, and I'd see my dad sometimes. And as I got older, I got to know him over cups of coffee. My father would always have a cup of coffee on the go. And the reason was that when he was a teenager, he and his friends would hang out in this one cafe where the rule was you can stay in the, they would sit in the cafe and talk about girls and flirt and all that sort of thing. They're teenagers. And they would stay in the cafe and you could stay as long as you like provided you still had some coffee in your cup. So in the morning, he and his friends would buy a cup of coffee and sit with it all day in this cafe, sipping cold coffee. And I learned as a teenager that if the question was for my father, would you like a coffee? He would say, the answer is always going to be yes. <laughs> you can just make the coffee. I'm going to say yes to a cup of coffee. And so to this day, not so much in a paper cup. It has to be in a china cup, because that's how the Pavlovian Association works. <laughs> if I sit down and there's a coffee in any kind of china cup, fresh, just, just a, what in the US you'd call an Americana, a coffee with some milk in it, I get a Pavlovian response in my body of joy. I was getting to meet my father. That association has nothing to do with whether coffee is good for you or bad for you. I think that the, um, what do you call it in America, the FDA? I think they flip a coin every year to decide. <laughs> We have the same thing in the UK with eggs. Every year, the eggs are good for you or bad for you, and they, they, just, they just decide on a coin flip at the Christmas party. So the, because I feel good about coffee, I tend to talk about coffee and joke about it with my friends. And the, it's my go-to. And I travel a lot. I'm often in the wrong time zone. So a cup of coffee is my thing. And coffee has no cognitive impact whatsoever. There have been plenty of studies. It doesn't do anything to your brain. But because it makes you feel jumpy, it, it, it blocks a receptor in your nervous system that allows the nerves to, to uh, misfire every now and then. And we associate that with wakefulness. And because we associate that sensation with wakefulness, our brains think, oh, I should be more awake because I'm feeling jumpy. And your brain makes itself more awake. And it therefore has the placebo effect of making you wake up. The net net is that you wake up. It's crazy. So all of that's going on. But the real reason I like coffee is I got to know my dad over cups of coffee. What is that? It's a feeling. It's a feeling. Do I approve or disapprove? Well, I'm a primate, and our parentage is really important. And the relationships we have with our parents are crucial to our development. And so I have my ancestral memory, my genetic memory, that tells me that my relationship with my parents is important. I don't know how it's important. I'm punching my hand. I don't know why. But it's very important that I have a connection with my father. And I didn't grow up with him, which makes it even more critical. And so yes, coffee matters to me. Should I have an opinion about that? Or maybe it's just part of the texture of my personality. So. Over time, in life, you are going to discover that there are things that are consistent priorities for you. And maybe it's going to be that you're respected. I was talking about martial arts earlier. You, will, you know, you go to a bar and you spill someone's pint. That's, the, you know, that's the, the joke. And someone says, did you spill my pint? And then they want to fight you. They're aggressive. Usually. That's because they're insecure. They're quite frightened people. And that insecurity manifests itself as an attempt to compensate and make sure everyone around them feels threatened in order that they don't seem vulnerable. They want to seem the least vulnerable person in the room. You will never find an experienced martial artist saying, oh, did you spill my pint? I'm trying to get into a fight. They're much more likely to say, no, no, everything's fine. Don't worry about it. I didn't want to drink that much anyway. It's OK. So, in my experience, and this is purely subjective, people who have a positive internal trait, like confidence and kindness, I spoke a lot last year about kindness. It's very, very important. People who are kind usually manifest that positive internal quality in positive ways. 
But I have a theory that people who have a negative internal trait, let's say self-worth, for example, people who have low self-worth, there are lots of reasons why. Existential uncertainty, it's difficult to get it right. Existential angst, as they would say. I think we should have existential joy, because you never know what you're doing, really. So have fun. Life is like a big <laughs> ball pit. Where shall I jump into the ball pit? I don't know. I'm going to jump over here. It's just as good as anywhere else. But enjoy the consequences. There might be a small child <laughs> under the ball pit. So we need an adult-sized ball pit. But that's another, that's another patent pending, I suppose. So uh, when you ha let's say you have low self-worth. People who have low self-worth will tend to make a lot of comments about how special they are, about how bad other people are, they often express their negative internal trait as an inversion of that trait outwardly. People who feel physically frightened tend to be physically aggressive. Now, I'm not mentioning this in order that you can judge the people that you meet that have a, a negative outward expression. But if I'm right, isn't that fascinating? Because it means that if you meet somebody that's always doing that Billy the Kid thing with you, you meet somebody who's always trying to prove you wrong, you realize it's because they're insecure about how they are perceived. They're insecure about how respected they are. Take it from me. If you meet somebody that keeps trying to prove that they know better than you, the antidote is to, to demonstrate respect and that you value them. Because that's the reassurance they're probably seeking. And as soon as they get it, they'll be great. As soon as you show them how much you value and appreciate them and how high your regard is for their opinions, they will stop feeling that insecurity and they'll play and they'll be nice. Isn't that powerful as, a, as an antidote to negative behavior? Not to judge them, but because they have their reasons. They've got their reasons for behaving that way. You just almost never know them. In fact, you almost never know your own reasons for behaving the way you behave. It's very rare that we know. However, over time, seven minutes to say 15 things. OK, over time, I think, you know, last year at this conference, I spoke about volition, coercion, and decision making. And this year, I wanted to talk about why. And I, and I wanted to talk about how do you come to know yourself? What does that mean to say, selfhood, to say that you have an identity, personification. What are you? Who are you? Now, the short answer is you've no idea. So good luck with that. Have another coffee, <laughs> maybe a macaroon. But over time, we discover that we have priorities that are persistent. Some priorities come and go. Some things change. Your circumstance changes. You respond to it in different ways. But over time, you will discover that there are certain things that matter to you and certain things that don't. Like you know, we were talking about earlier, cushion covers. And you know, I find it really difficult to have an opinion about textiles. I just struggle. You know, it's cloth. And I know that that's important, but I just. I struggle, and I've learned about myself that it's not that important, which is not to say that I think it is intrinsically important or unimportant. From which vantage point shall I claim to have an objective perspective? As a species, we tend to confuse our subjective experience, which is true and real, and you are experiencing it. It's, it is real with the objective facts. And those two kinds of truth are not the same thing. Unfortunately, it is our nature, or maybe fortunately, who can say? But it is our nature to confuse the two and to think that our subjective perception of something that happened is the objective truth. And it takes pragmatism to recognize that we might be mistaken. Accepting that, for me, textiles are just not super important. I've come to learn that you know, they're just not super important. Uh, show me a new kind of watch that can translate languages and work like a walkie-talkie, or a phone that can do augmented reality stuff, or better yet, let's talk about natural language interaction with computers and, and artificial intelligence. I'm right there. And I have come to learn about myself 
that there are persistent priorities, and those persistent priorities are the shape of me. So gradually we come to learn who we are. That is your personality as you know yourself. Can you claim to know the intent of another person? Forget it. You barely know your own. But you can, over time, come to know only without judgment. If you add judgment, forget it. You're never going to do it. You're never going to see yourself clearly if you're busy judging yourself. And by that, again, I don't mean discernment. I mean if you have value judgments and opinions about the rightness and wrongness, about the acceptability, about the worth of your characteristics, you are in trouble. Because you can never see yourself clearly through that lens. It distorts your perception. But if you can, in the privacy of your own mind, really perceive yourself, you can begin to get this shape of your personality. This is my persona, which is a construct. And once you can see it clearly, then you can decide as a later stage, do I want those priorities? So what I'm saying is that our decision making actually rests on not our, how clever we are or, or what our opinions are. It rests on our feelings. And our feelings are a response to our priorities. Where do your priorities come from? They come from your genes. They come from your early learning. It's nature and nurture. But they're also, it's a feedback loop. Sweet things are not tasty at all. Sweet food does not taste good. It just tastes sweet. But your brain learns very early on that sweet foods have a high energy source in them. And it, your brain releases, as a child, your brain releases happy drugs into itself to say, do that again. That is good. Let's have more of that. And because 200,000 years ago, which is pretty much when we as a species went through a major jump in our evolution, it's probably the last time we had any major jumps in our evolution, sweet, high energy foods were rare. Our brains are still right on that case. And so our biology is affecting our priorities. Our environment, the people we learn from, our culture, our society, our friends, our loved ones, all of those things are shaping our priorities. And those priorities lead to our wants and desires. And they lead to our feelings. The perception of beauty has changed over the centuries. But the desire to be loved, the desire to be wanted, the desire to matter, the desire to be respected, the desire to be accepted, these things have never changed, not for hundreds of thousands of years. And so if you can recognize which of your priorities are rooted in those fundamental human needs and seek to serve them without judgment, then you can decide about the other needs that you have and decide if you want them or not. Because those are the things that are making your decisions. And I know John's looking at me because time is running out, but I want to say, Two brief things, and then we're going to wrap up. OK, he's doing the turny thing. Um, OK. So I share my time between consulting as a futurist for a lot of different organizations. I talk about where we're going in terms of technology. I'm chief futurist for a, a micro supercomputer company. I'm on the board for a, a true AI autonomous hedge fund. I've consulted for a lot of organizations. And I share my time between doing that and I direct films. I just directed my first feature film. and. I write books on post-production. If anyone's heard of Premiere Pro by Adobe, I write the official book on that. I also write the official book on Audition, a bunch of post-production stuff. And I would argue that a person is, in a sense, a narrative. You have a narrative, and that narrative is your sense of self. And the beautiful thing is that you get to choose the narrative that you live. And it comes from your perceptions of yourself within your world. The more clearly you can see both, the more easily you can navigate. You cannot use a map unless you know where you are on it. Plato described the concept of original forms. Anyone heard of the Plato's forms? So there is a pure form of what a cup is that is flawless. And as soon as that form is manifested in the world, it's instantly flawed. It has a finite lifespan. It has a finite being. And it's, it's improper. There's a version of you 
that is unchanged by your negative experiences and your false interpretation of them, the emotional and physical violence that you've suffered, your misinterpretation of events, the ways you've judged yourself and punished yourself, attacked yourself for the misadventures that you've taken. There's a version of you that understands itself and is perfect. And you know who that person is. You know who that person is. And it turns out that you can imagine who they are and what they're like. And in imagining who they are and what they are like, you can turn to them for decision-making and guidance. What would the real me do now is the question. What would the real me do now? And you will find, just as a thought experiment, that if you ask yourself that question from time to time, you will discover you always feel at peace with the decision. And they say if you walk like a duck and talk like a duck, you're a duck. If you walk and talk like the real you, you'll probably gradually become yourself. And then you'll be making decisions based on a why that is true to you and not true to some fabricated, fear-based understanding of you. That's how to be really yourself. And I'm totally out of time. I'll be, I'll be doing handstands later and drinking wine. I'm Maxim Jago. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>